to everyone this evening. If you're a guest this evening, we welcome you tonight. We're glad to have you. If you're not a guest this evening, it's good to have you. And uh, those of you that are watching us online, we welcome you as a part of this service this evening as well. And uh, as we've sort of been, I guess, gotten into the habit on Thursday nights, if you'd like to give, uh, worship the Lord with your giving this evening, you can do that in the, the box on the back wall um, after we are done with service this evening. Would you stand and um, just kind of refresh, reset here? Um, I, I feel like we are, um, are, are the starting with last Sunday morning, just the Lord has been doing some very deep things in this congregation. And uh, Sunday evening was a continuation of that. And, and I feel like tonight is a little bit about uh, not saying everything God is trying to do is done. But I do believe God has done a lot of significant things. There's just, there's been a very deep cleansing that has taken place. And I don't know about you, but I don't really want to have to repeat the last week and a half, two weeks. Please take this in the most positive way, please. But I sat there that Sunday morning when Brother Herring was preaching and as the message went on, I began to sit there and go, Oh, God, I am not looking forward to the next few days. And I was a prophet. While I deeply appreciate all of the clearing of the air, it's not a fun thing, but it's such a needful thing. And I don't know, again, I don't know about you, but I'd rather not have to, you know, kind of, go to that extreme again. So I think tonight is, is kind of a little bit more of sort of like Sunday night and proactive and how can we continue and maintain. And I don't, sometimes we say maintain and that's a negative thing. Other times I think maintain is a, is a positive thing. So read a couple of verses to you and then um, let you sit down. 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, Paul says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And then down to verse 20 says, But now are they many members, yet but one body. They are many members, but one body. We are many members, but we're one body. And part of, and it's not really what I'm going to focus on here this evening, but part of the context of what Paul talks about is with the natural body, it has many different members, but those members are not in competition with one another. And I, I know that there are some members of our bodies that we can't live without. I mean, you can't live without a heart. <laughs> you can't live without lungs. There's some things you have, there's some vital organs. But then there are a number of things that, you know, you can live without an arm. You can live without legs. There, you can live without hair. You can live without, there's a lot of, you can live without eyeballs. There's a lot of things you can live without, but none of us are volunteering to get rid of any of those things. And, and that's because while there may be organs that are vital and other parts that are not vital, the bottom line is this, every part of the body has a purpose. And therefore, because every part has a purpose, it's not threatened by another part of the body's purpose. Boy, if we could ever, and I said we, I didn't say you, I said we, if we could ever truly make peace with who you are and who I am in the body, there's no telling where God could ultimately take us. Because as long as we're sitting here comparing ourselves among ourselves 
and judging ourselves by ourselves and threatened by each other, there is a cap on what God can do. Praise God. Father, thank you for your presence that we feel in this place tonight. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of being here. Thank you for your sweet touch that's been in this place this evening. God, I pray now, Lord, you've been doing some wonderful things. They're not enjoyable, pleasant things, but you've been doing some great things, some deep things in our hearts individually and in this body collectively for a while, but especially this last week and a half, God, you've been digging and cleansing and renewing and refreshing. And So I pray that tonight you would continue that work. You would speak tonight what we need to hear to help us stay on the right path and continue on that path. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So that, That's kind of just the, the intro, foundational intro. Psalms 133 and verse number 1 says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For, the, for there the Lord commanded the blessing even life evermore. The Message Bible says it this way, How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. <laughs> Any moms and dads with uh, multiple kids in the house feel that way? It's like costly anointing oil flowing down head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. It's like the dew of Mount Hermon flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. And then the Passion Translation says it this way, How truly wonderful and delightful it is to see brothers and sisters living together in sweet unity. It's as precious as the sacred scented oil flowing from the head of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard and running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robes. This harmony can be compared to the dew dripping from Mount Hermon, which flows down upon the hills of Zion. Indeed, that is where Yahweh has decreed His blessings will be found, the promises of life forevermore. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. If it says that it's good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity, it didn't say how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. It says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I, I, uh, I, I, I feel like over these last few days as the Lord has brought this passage to my mind, my spirit, I, I think sometimes we approach this unity thing a bit passively. That, you know, it's kind of on God. It's on the Spirit of God to produce unity. And, and we are just passive participants in that. You know, there, there's been times, and I'm sure there's others that uh, can, can relate to this, where you've, you've started to dig into a verse, and you've started to dig into the meaning of a word in a verse, and man, you discovered this amazing nugget. That's an awesome experience. Because the flip side of that, there have been times where I started to get ready to dig into a verse and I just knew I was about to uncover some deep, amazing meaning. And I tried every resource, every dictionary I could and could not find it. You want to take a guess at which one of those two this verse is? 
I, I went to that word dwell because I was really expecting, because there's some places, and I don't have any, I, any examples popping into my mind offhand, but there's been some, there's some times where you've gone, I, I, in fact, I just thought of one. One of them is, is Jezebel. You know, Jezebel is, is one of the not-so-good characters in the Bible. She she's, has a legacy that's continued on, and, and what she represents continues on in the church today. Uh, and, and I can't remember the exact definition, but if you look up Jezebel's name, it actually is not in, it, it doesn't resemble who she is. She actually has a very positive meaning to her name. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't discover that with this word because I really was hoping, I was expecting <laughs> that there was going to be something about this word dwell that was, that was going to basically mean effort, work, labor. It doesn't. In fact, it, it means, however, it does mean to cause, to sit, to cause to abide, to set to cause to dwell, to make to dwell. So, so there is an influence, there is an effort to cause. Any parents know what it's like to cause your kids to do something? That means there's some kind of force, hopefully not improper physical, but some kind of force, some kind of influence Sometimes it's in the form of, if you don't, then I will. It, it's good for brethren to dwell together. It's, it's good for us to, 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 to cause ourselves. It's good for us to put forth the work and the effort necessary for us to dwell together in unity. Not intolerance. I think we've set some bars a little low in some areas. We've got some areas where we, well, we have them really high. We, we are proud of how high. But then there's some other areas we set some bars really low. We got really high doctrinal bars. But then when it comes to some other things, man, we, we kind of... <laughs> One of the churches in Revelation that the, the angel said to him, you, you know, you, you guys, you, you don't tolerate those that don't preach the truth. You don't, you don't tolerate those that are not in alignment. But, but I still got some things against you. And, and so I, I want to take a few moments. This is going to, I think this might feel like in the next moment it's about to take this completely sharp left turn. But, but it really all ties in together. And I, and I don't want you, because... Some of you, with where I'm about to go for the next few moments, you're, you're going to check out on me because you just you're not into this kind of thing. But stay with me. But last Thursday morning, last week, man, it's crazy how time flies. Last Thursday, we Thursday morning at our district ministers retreat, Brother Raymond Woodward was our our speaker this year, and um, some of you at least know that name from. Um, Grow and uh, the selfie series that we have as a part of our grow discipleship process, and so great teacher, just just and and so he um he he touched on some things on Thursday morning, and he went kind of way in depth, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of give you a really quick breeze over of it, and and um, I, I really just being honest with you, I really struggle whenever I do something similar to what somebody else has done, because I've tried that a few times in the past intentionally, and it's miserably failed, so I have PTSD. But, but there were some things as he was kind of talking, and, and, and then I don't remember exactly what point this Psalms 133 began to kind of roll around in my spirit, but in, in connection with this. And so um, we... we uh, how many of you have done colors so far? How many of you have done the colors personality test? That's a, that's a pretty decent percentage. 
So I, I didn't really know this. I think it gets mentioned in colors, but, but I mean, we're, we're talking a couple of thousand years now, at least, that there's been this interest in personality types, and, and apparently all the way back to um, hip, hip, can't even say it, hip, Hippocrates, is that right? Hypocrite, Hippocrates. Uh, that, that he actually identified four basic and, and melancholy, phlegmat, whatever all those things are. And, and, but here we are a um, um, couple thousand years later, and, um, oh my goodness, technology is great when it works. It's very frustrating when it doesn't work, so I just need to give it up. But brother, uh, so so brother brother Woodward took really almost the whole morning, two sessions, kind of going through this and then some other stuff. But but he, he kind of went through and and for those that um, maybe I mean we kind of did initial pers- personality. Um, he he kind of took the took the two lot the two uh, axes there, the vertical and the horizontal, and and without any of the writing up there, now you're all cheating. Because uh, I have it all up there, we you 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 kind of put a dot um, on so on the horiz- or excuse me the vertical line tasks versus relationships. So whichever side of that you're more on, um, he used some great examples. He, I, I'll just repeat his examples. I'm gonna be a copycat here for a few moments, but he talked about he he's more of a task oriented person and and uh, you know he used the example if if you had a guest speaker and they had something that to put on the presentation for the service. If somebody gave it to him to take to the media department, he would leave out of his office and he would go straight to the media department. He wouldn't say hello to anyone. He wouldn't smile at anyone. He wouldn't pause, talk to anyone. It was He's got a job to do. And then he used uh, his, his assistant pastor, who's now the pastor there, he said if he was to have the same job, by the time he got, because you have to go through the foyer, he said, to get from his office to the media department. When he got to the foyer and all the people are walking in for service and stuff, he would start greeting people, talking to people, meeting new people, kissing babies, and all this stuff. And then it'd be service time, and the, 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 the thing would have never gotten to the media department. So that's a little bit kind of what that is. And then quick and slow is sort of how impulsive you are. Some of you... You, you, you don't even think, let's do it, let's just, let's, let's go buy a car, let's, let's go buy a car right now. And others you take forever and ever and ever to finally make a decision. And so you kind of put a dot where, and then, and so isn't this a beautiful slide? Yeah. Jalen put that together, great job. Took notes and put that all together. And so he added, so kind of more basic is the populars, the peacefuls, the perfects, and the powerfuls, uh, and those correlate to the other four um, personality types that I can never remember um, that sound way more boring. I mean, who wants to be called melancholy? And, and, and so he took, and, and uh, it's a little bit challenging to see here, but uh, he, he correlated the colors so in the bottom right, you've got the oranges, then you've got the blues, then you've got the golds, then you have the greens. And, you know, I, I can relate, I'll tell my own story quickly here, but I can relate to, to Brother uh, Woodward's story because uh, and it goes back to Fearless Fun years ago, and, and we're in the middle of Fearless Fun, and I'm ultimately I'm not doing all the work but ultimately I'm the person responsible I'm the guy that's got to make whatever calls and decisions and I'm doing that and not thinking anything about it and, and a couple of months after one of the fearless fun nights this this uh, young lady who had been grown up in church but left and was going through some major struggles came in wanted to talk try to get some guidance and and we're sitting there and she said you and you you have a problem with me I'm like I do yeah, you, you won't even talk to what I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And so she begins to tell me about coming to Fearless Fun, and I walked right by her and did not stop and speak to her. And I said, you know, first of all, I don't remember that. 
But secondly, there's a really good chance I was probably in the middle of having to do something. I was going to fix something, help somebody, so I wasn't even focused. And, and so we have, and, and, and I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to get bogged down in this, but, but let me just, so we'll, we'll start with the populars, and the strength is enthusiasm, weakness is impulsive, the desire is to have fun. Hence the oranges. The peacefuls, their strength is people skills. Their weakness is reluctant to commit. Their desire is to have peace. Let's all just be at peace. The perfects, that's not that they are perfect. And that's the category I'm, I, I'm in, so I'm not casting stones. I can tell you I am far from perfect but we live under this weight of trying to be perfect. The perfect strength is accuracy. Their weakness is too thorough. Their desire is excellence. And then the powerfuls, their strength is initiative. Their weakness is insensitive. Their desire is control. Of course, those of you that have done real colors know you basically have a dominant one and then a secondary one. And I think for a number of us, our secondary is on the opposite side, the same top or bottom, so for me, if you haven't done real colors yet, I'm giving it away, but I am orange, or excuse me, I'm not orange, <laughs> I'm anything <laughs> but orange. I am gold, and I am green, and thankfully, my better half is orange and blue, so there is a great balance. And, and so this is, this is he, here's, where, here's where I'm getting at. So you kind of, when we did this, you, you were supposed to kind of put a dot on the horizontal and the vertical line, kind of depending how to, much to the extreme of, of those things you were. There is, and I was trying, the thing I'm trying to do, would, I love it when you have stuff you're supposed to be able to do and you can't get it to work. But, but I, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to draw a circle right around where those two axes cross. Because at that specific intersection is Jesus. <laughs> he is the absolute perfect balance of it all. The rest of us not so much. And the problem is this. The golds can really drive the oranges crazy. I don't know why the oranges would ever drive the golds crazy. I'm, no, excuse me. I'm, I'm getting myself confused. Yeah, I think the oranges can really drive the golds crazy. I don't know how the oranges cannot be fully appreciative of us golds and the order and rigidity we bring to a chaotic world. Sister Angie says no color bashing. So, But, but that's the problem is we, we do okay with those that are like us. But we struggle with those that are not like us. And if we're going to dwell together in unity, if we're going to dwell together, we've got to be more intentional, more on purpose with how we react and respond to each other that's not like us. Because the beauty is we are one body. And all members of the same body. And every member is needed in the body. <laughs> I've heard Brother Woodward say this a while back on one of his messages I was watching, but he repeated it last week. And that is, before marriage, opposites attract.
after marriage, opposites attack. Before marriage, it's a wonderful thing that one of you is neat and tidy and everything's in order, and the other person not so much. That's okay when you're not living together. I, I, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus here. But you walk into our closet, and one side is neat, orderly, rarely ever anything on the floor. The other side, not so much. You know what? An interesting thing is when relationships are healthy, those things don't bother us. We get a really good feel for the health of our relationships when stuff starts to eat on us. When you, when you, you know, you, 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 some of you Sunday school, that, I think that'd be a good one. You, you walk in and somebody was supposed to have done some prep and they're an orange. They haven't done their job yet. In fact, they're not even there yet. I mean, it's an hour and a half until all this starts. Where are they? You know what? When things are good, no big deal. You just fill in. It's when things are not going great, when relationships, when we're not dwelling together in unity, that becomes a source of contention. When, when I, I, I've heard it kind of in different ways, but you know, we, we the, the story of, 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 of Mary and Martha, and, and, and uh, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, fellowshipping and, and enjoying her time of fellowship, and Martha is in the kitchen, and she's preparing everything for the guests and getting ready, and, and she comes to Jesus. You know, and Lord, you need to send her into the kitchen. Of course, the Lord responds, and this is the part I usually, you know, we tend to focus on. The Lord responds and says, you know, Martha, you are cumbered about much serving. Sort of a shame on you. But somebody needed to do it. Somebody needed to be showing hospitality for the guests. Somebody needed to be fixing some food. So you can't tell me that what Martha was doing was the wrong thing. But I think what is indicated by Martha's attitude is she had not been spending enough time in fellowship. And so her service, I've said it before, I'll just be transparent with you. I've said it, I've shared this before, but there's been times, and I don't do as much for different reasons as I used to do, but I used to be a little more involved on a regular basis and trying to help around the yard and things outside. And when I'm, when I'm in a good place... I have, you, you should hear some of the messages I have preached on that John Deere tractor. I mean, some of the greatest messages I've ever preached have been on that John Deere tractor. I know the best solos I've ever sung have been on there. <laughs> but I also know when I'm not in a very good place because I'm doing the same stuff... But I'm riding around thinking, where is everybody else that ought to be doing? How come, I, how come, how come I? Same actions. Doing the same thing, but the response when I'm not dwelling together in unity. And, and again, I said it sort of half-heartedly, even though I didn't mean it half-heartedly. I, I, I don't want to get three or four years down the road and need another message like we heard last week. But if we don't live mindful that we are supposed to be dwelling together in unity. L -l -listen, to, listen to this. Some of you know this story, but I, I think I used it recently in a message, different context, but Genesis 13, verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelled, Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, 
and between my herdmen and thy herdmen because we are brethren. I wish I hadn't have put that next verse on this slide. I wish I'd have put it on the next slide because you've already read it or are reading it if you can see it. But look what he says. He, he said, don't let there be strife between us because we are brethren. There shouldn't be contention between us. We ought to be able to dwell together because we are brethren. But look at what the solution was. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. I don't believe that was the solution. We're not getting along. We're not dwelling together in unity. So let's part ways. We're brethren, but let's part ways. No, we're brethren, so let's figure out how to dwell together in unity. We're brethren, so let's figure out how we can deal with this strife that's between us, but still dwell and live in the same place. I do not, I don't mean at all, I am not trying to blame Abraham because everybody's got to make their own decisions. But I wonder if the story of Lot could have gone differently had Abraham and Lot figured out how to stay together. Maybe Lot wouldn't have ended up pitching his tent towards Sodom, and maybe Lot wouldn't have ended ended up with his family getting intertwined and his wife getting so caught up in Sodom that when the angel of the Lord says, you got to leave and don't look back. I don't know about you. I think I probably, in human nature, I would have wondered, would I really turn to salt if I look back? But I got to tell you, as I was maybe thinking that in my mind, I wonder, but I ain't going to find out. Lot's wife had gotten so intertwined, she was willing to risk it. In fact, it seems like she almost couldn't help herself. But again, I wonder. I wonder if Abraham would have said to Lot, Listen, Lot, this is not going well. We got some issues between us, and we got our, our people are fighting with each other. We, we, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's figure this out. I've learned something, and I think a few of you might be able to give me an amen on this. I've, I've learned that 99% of the time when I finally say, hey, we need to talk, and we sit down and start talking about the issue, I have found that the great majority of the time it never goes as bad as I had it worked up in my mind it was going to go. Is it any wonder the enemy tries to get you to think, hey, don't talk, it's just gonna, it'll be bad. It'll be bad if you try to talk to him. It'll go bad if you, it'll, it'll blow up. Why do you think he does that? Because he knows the solution is we got to get rid of this strife so we can dwell together in unity. And so anything and everything he can do to keep you separated, he's going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to say this, I'm going to try to say this in the Holy Ghost, but I may be just saying it as the pastor that loves you. There's some families, some, I, there's some folks, hopefully they're listening or will listen, will watch. There's some families in this church that all of you are in church, but you've decided to make up your minds we're just going to part ways because we got, that's not the will of God. That, that's part of what I meant a few moments ago when I said we set the bar low. Bless God, you better be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost and all this stuff. But, you know, it's okay if families can't get along. I'm, not, I'm talking about Holy Ghost filled people. I'm not talking about, bottom line is some of you get along better with your unsaved family than you do with your saved family. And as I just preached Sunday night, first question you ask is, is it I? And you know what? I, I think that's, when you're dealing with parent and children stuff, that's really tough on the parents. 
Because we know it's never the parents at fault. Parents never make, is that right? Mile and Kirby, come on, help me out. Help me, I need a little help here. Parents never, parents never mishandle things. Parents never misspeak. Again, as my dad would say, just in case you're missing it, sarcasm alert. <laughs> I do not mean any of that. The will of God. I, I taught, was it last year, I think, I taught about the will of God for a while. And to be saved, you've got to do the will of God. It is the will of God for us to dwell together in unity. And I understand, I understand there's some people that are not willing to change. But until you know you've truly done your part, it's an easy thing to just sit and point fingers at everybody else. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Paul says this in Ephesians, I therefore, Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. The Amplified says, living as becomes you, with complete lowliness of mind, humility and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. That's not talking about compromising truth there. He's not talking about changing your beliefs. We can love one another and, and, and make space and create space for, for people to have a chance to grow and develop. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of and produced by the Spirit in the binding power of peace. Be eager and strive earnestly. Message Bible says, Mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love. Please, I'm not trying to say sound negative, and I've tried to express my deep appreciation and gratitude for what God has done here over the course of the last several weeks. But let's not let it be fits and starts. Let's don't get down to, you know, a couple of years down the road. Let's don't get to 2023 and go, hey, remember that re weekend where God laid us wide open? Well, we had a great couple of weeks, but no, no. It's where we're supposed to live. That's steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love. Alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Not alert at noticing the difference in the sense of, yeah, well, I, no. You know what? I'm, I'm orange. I mean, I'm, I don't know what I am. I'm having an identity crisis. That's what I am. Maybe that's my subconscious speaking, what it wishes I was. Being mindful, mindful. We've got different strengths. We've got different weaknesses. Intentionally done by God so that we can complement each other, not criticize each other. And then the Passion Translation says, With tender humility and quiet patience, Always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. Let's, let's, let's do that one again. Tender humility and quiet patience. Always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. 
Those that try our patience are the ones we're supposed to be putting the most effort for. Most mindful of. Endeavoring. Striving to keep the unity of the Spirit. And the bond of peace. Striving. Working at. Pursuing. Imagine where, what we could become if we would truly let that get a hold of us. That rather than those moments where we see issues or flaws or somebody's mistakes and we want to jump on it. Yeah. If our reaction was, okay, we got, we got an issue, we got a problem here, but how can we deal with this to maintain the unity? How can we deal with this to, to preserve peace? How can we deal with this to make sure that we stay one? Not how can I start texting my friends and tell them. Not how can I get on the phone with my buddies and start gossiping. You know what? There's too many of us that are gossips and don't know it. I'm not trying to, I want the unity of the Spirit preserved. Chances are, if you're talking about somebody that's not present, there's a really good chance if it's not positive, then it's gossip. And what some of you are so, I don't mean this word disparagingly, I mean it in the definition of the word. It's not, a, I don't mean it derogatory. It just, it's the word that describes it. Some of you are so ignorant of the fact, if they'll sit there with you and talk about someone else, don't be foolish enough to think they're not going to go with somebody else and talk about you. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. What do we do when we hear rumors? I, uh, you know, one of, one of the most, I don't, I, I don't remember as a kid campfires at houses. And if y'all, my age and older, you did campfires at your house? Only time, growing up, only time we ever had campfires was when we went camping. That was it. Now, man, we've I've had a fire pit at my house for years, and one of the absolute most enjoyable, relaxing things that I love to do is just sit in my backyard with a fire. I love having my family around, but I'm probably not going to talk to you. <laughs> Y'all can talk all you want. I don't care. I'll listen. I'll laugh, but I'm just, I love it. And one of the things I really love to do is to sit there with my bellows and fan the flame. Poor brother Andrew came up here from North Carolina. They didn't know what bellows were in North Carolina. He was trying to figure it out. <laughs> I couldn't let that one pass. Man, you can get that fire going. What do we do when, when we hear about somebody's flaws or mistakes? Do we get our bellows out or do we get our fire extinguisher out? I, I, the problem is, you know, I'm, I'm talking about dwelling together in unity. I'm talking about endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. The, the, the problem is, we're, we're, we're quick to pass information along. We're not sure if it's true or not. You know what I heard about so-and-so? I, I don't know if this, but I heard that, you know, they, they, they did such and such. And then we find out that we were actually wrong. But do we take the time to go back through the inventory? Uh-oh. Let me see who all did I tell that to. So now we're resolved, we know, and now we think better of that person, but now we've left. I, I, there was a situation, I, I, I'm not perfect at this, it's just happened this morning, actually. 
But it was a situation I was sharing with my wife that I was struggling a little about, a bit about in the last week or so. And, and, but this morning I said, I, I want to be clear, this, this struggle, it, it's not about their fault. It's not that they did something wrong. Just, just my stuff. <laughs> We don't, we, don't, we don't go back and undo endeavoring, striving. Man, it's a wonderful thing when you got people surrounding you that when you have a bad day and somebody notices you're having a bad day and they start to criticize you're having a bad day. Somebody else speaks up for you and says, you know what, I, I know them. They're having a bad day. Not, can you believe it? Whew. How dare... Whew. Endeavoring, striving to keep the unity of the Spirit. Paul says this in Philippians 2 and 1. I there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name I think the Passion Translation is competing these days with the Message Bible, so here we go. I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and, one, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy." I think it stands to reason that, the re that Paul is saying this to the church at Philippi because there's not this. Right. Why, why would he be asking them to be joined together in perfect unity if they were already in perfect unity? Right. We are so far from perfect as a congregation, it's not even funny as I guess the saying goes. I, I know many of you have been through it. We did it in here pre-COVID one night, but then others of you have attended it. I, I, my session of Welcome to Antioch is who we are. That's the session. And, and I intentionally chose that, and a big focus in that lesson is pointing out the fact we are not perfect. And especially for the new people, I want to tell you right up front, as the pastor, we are not perfect. Because there's no such thing as a perfect church. And when you read the book of Acts, and you read through the epistles, and you read the things they were addressing, I, I say this in Welcome to Antioch, I've said it at other times in other settings, there's things that Paul addresses in some of his epistles that if they happen today, it's one of those things where news channel or TV stations would be lined up in the parking lot to report the story. I mean, was it the Corinthians, I think, where he tells them, hey, hey sons ain't supposed to be sleeping with their dad's wife. I'm assuming it's, it was the way it's said. I'm assuming it means a stepmother, I guess. I mean, either one of them's wrong. Can you imagine what happened if that, that word gets out? And that's what Paul was dealing with. Every now and then I just remind myself of what the apostles dealt with and I feel a little bit better. 
But he says, I, I'm asking you, Antioch Central, I'm asking you, I'm, I'm appealing to you that we be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. Be free from pride-filled opinions. Oh, God. I know there ain't none of those in this congregation. I'm talking about other churches. Pride filled. Boy, if I was, and I don't mean just with regards to me as the pastor. This happens with ministries as well. Well, if I was, if I was in charge, if I was the head usher, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, guess what? You're not. And there's a really good chance God chose for you not to be because if you were, you'd do something worse than the one that's in the place is doing. Do you ever think about maybe the reason you don't have the job is because you'd do a worse job, not because you'd do a better job? Be free from pride-filled opinions. Can you imagine, Sister, Sister Angie, uh, 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 Brother Isaac, Brother and Sister Spriggs, and uh, Brother McGurk, and I know I'm missing some ministry leaders, ministry department heads. How wonderful it would be if you, would, you knew. I, I, I want feedback. Don't, don't get me wrong. I want people's opinion. I want most of the people I work with the most around here are oranges. I guess, and the number of them that I work with, I guess God's trying to show me how stubborn and hard-headed I am. Because it's not just one or two. I'm married to one. I work with a bunch of them. I don't want people just to see things my way. There's no, I, wanna, I want different perspective. But there's an attitude and a spirit with which that can be done in the right way. How wonderful would it be for, for those in roles of leadership to not have to walk around worried about the people they're leading with, with, with pride-filled opinions. You can usually tell, you might want to just tune out the rest of the part if somebody starts with the statement, well, if I was in charge. There's a couple of catchphrases that you ought to really learn how to tell people, shh, if I was in charge, or have you heard? No, and I don't want to. For they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't, self don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility put others first and view others as more important than yourself. Not, not just in words, not just in good, you know, well, yeah, oh, no, no, you're... Authentic humility. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. And consider the example that Jesus, the Anointed One, has set before us. Let His mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet He gave no thought to seizing equality with God as His supreme prize. Instead, He emptied Himself of His outward glory by reducing Himself to the form of a a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a, as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. He made himself of no reputation. Boy, we live in this social media world of making ourselves of reputation. I, I scroll through Facebook and Instagram sometimes, and I have both of them. I'm not a social media basher. I, there's a lot of negative on them. There's a lot of junk, but then there's some things that are positive and enjoyable as well. But it cracks me up, these, these pictures of, 
you know, these preachers, pastors that post these pictures of themselves like in the pulpit. They, they've got this really deep theological statement that goes along with it, but it's themselves, you know, in some kind of, you know, great pose. What, what is this all about? He, I'm pretty sure if Jesus had Instagram and Facebook, I mean, if Jesus had Instagram and Facebook, we know this is how it would have been working. They'd have brought those five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Peter, here, take my phone. Make sure you get some pictures of this. <laughs> he made him self. Why? Because he was working to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. How beautiful and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. To, to do what enhances unity. I, I want to I do a better job. I, I, I'm up in that upper left-hand corner, so this is not some great spiritual characteristic or quality. It just, I think it's just part of my personality. I, I, don't, I don't pop off at the mouth. My, some of you, and this is, I mean this sincerely and hear me because I'm going to say the other side of the coin. Some of you, your issue is you speak too quickly. Others of us is our, we don't speak quickly enough. And both of them can have consequences. There's been times I'm, I feel like as a, as a husband and as a dad, I, there are some things I should have said, especially some positive, encouraging things I should have said, but my personality, my nature is just to stay quiet. So I, I don't, I, I don't want to make this next point and all of you sit around thinking, well, boy, I, mm, I don't know about Pastor Wright. I don't sit around and just pop off at the mouth. I don't, I don't do that. But I, I want to be mindful, even more mindful, that when I am going to speak, and I, I don't mean speaking from the pulpit, I mean speaking in conversation with, with people. I want to be even more mindful. Is what I'm, going, what I'm about to say going to contribute to the unity of the people that I am a part of? Is, is it going to contribute to the brethren dwelling together in unity, or is it going to contribute to division, separation, issues? Endeavoring, striving, working to keep the unity of the Spirit. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to close out with this. Kind of where I started. We are all members of the same body. Paul talks by, says, I can't remember the exact parts he uses in the way, but here's the gist of it. Can, 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 the, can the foot say to the hand, you're not the hand, so we don't need you. Can the eye say to the ear, you don't see, so we don't, we don't need you? No, no, no. I've struggled with it. Thank God I'm doing better than I've ever done before. I'd love to tell you it's absolutely never an issue anymore. I'd be lying. But I don't think I'm the only one. I know I'm not the only one in this place that has struggled. But I got a feeling I'm not the, that there are others in this place that you continue to struggle with the peace, making the peace with who you are. I've heard, I'm not going to call names, but I, I've heard it over the course of the last couple of years. People, well, so-and-so, it's all their, their names, always getting called. They're always out in front. They're always. Really what you're saying is you are not at peace with who you, It's really not everybody else's fault. It's really not. It's the fact that you 
have not made peace. And I'm not throwing stones. I'm not shooting at you because I've been there. <laughs> Your job is not to be somebody else, and somebody else's job is not to be you. Brother Vernell Spriggs Jr. has never preached. He spoke at But God, I think, right? Wasn't that But God? That was before COVID, so I don't. If God chooses otherwise, so be it. But at this point, he, he may never preach. So if he's going to compare his success and accomplishments to me or somebody else, it, it, it's, it's not the proper comparison. Because here's the bottom line, folks. The only thing you're supposed to compare to is what is the will of God for you. That's it. It's not what is he doing versus what I'm doing. Because you know what? You actually might be comparing yourself to somebody who's actually not even doing what they're really supposed to be doing. And so you're measuring by something that's not even accurate to begin with. Peter preaches and 3,000 people get the Holy Ghost one day. Stephen opens his mouth. He gets stoned to death. Who was the greater success? Who was the greater success, Peter or Stephen? Anybody? Neither. Neither was the greater. God chose Peter to speak on the day of Pentecost. He did his job. God chose Stephen to preach, get stoned, but a man by the name of Saul... You know what? It'd be so cool if in the next whatever time you got left at Anne Arundel, if uh, how many students are at Anne Arundel? Anybody know? Roughly a couple thousand, I'm assuming. I mean, if a thousand plus students got the Holy Ghost, got baptized in the next, wouldn't that be awesome? You would be the man. Whew. But what if in the time you got left at Anne Arundel, no one else, I think you've already been impactful in some people doing this but let's just say for the rest of the time there no one else comes to church no one else gets baptized no one else gets the holy ghost but what you don't know is that there's somebody that's been watching you hearing you and a seed gets sown into them and at some point down the road they impact thousands yeah right amen that's right yeah until you and I walk out and get in the car. Until we see the next post on social media. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. How good and pleasant it is to work together. Again, that word dwell, I wish it meant work together. It doesn't. So I'm paraphrasing. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sistern to work together to be in unity. Father, I thank you again for all that you've been doing. Obviously, you're always working. <laughs> even if we can't see it, even if we don't feel it, you're working. But Lord, over the course of the last several months, and especially this last week and a half, you've been doing some very significant, deep things. And God, I thank you again. I thank you again for precious people who are so responsive to your word and to your spirit. So God, I pray that you would help every one of us, that we would endeavor 
that the things you've been doing, and I don't think you're done, Lord, there's always more that can happen, more that can be worked on, but I pray that as you continue working that you would help us to get a hold of what Paul challenged the church at Ephesus to do, to strive, to work, to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We want that oil to flow down. We want those blessings to flow that are the result of dwelling together in unity. So God, let the work continue. Help us to continue with hearts, minds, spirits that are open to your word. God, not just open to hear the things that we like and we enjoy, but those things that you may need to continue to say to us or things you may need to say in the future that are words of course correction, adjustment. In the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I noticed one or two of you trying to take a picture of the slide earlier. I will uh, post the notes tomorrow morning on Realm if you'd like to have at least that slide or the rest of the notes as well. So God bless you. Those of you that are participating in the ministerial training, uh, we will convene in, in about five minutes downstairs. You can fellowship another night. Amen.